All right, thank you for having me. My name is Louis van Harte. I'm a PhD candidate at the Amsterdam University Medical Center, and today I will be talking about untangling the small intestine in 3D cine MRI using deep stochastic tracking. So, what is 3D cine MRI? Well, this modality is a real time 3D video showing a functional view of the intestines, and we can use this in diagnosis and research purposes for functional bowel diseases, such as IBD and IBS. And uh, when we're evaluating these images, we want to estimate the squeezing activity of the intestines in various sections. So this is generally done in a slice-by-slice -slice analysis, looking at these scans as a video. Um, but in such analysis, it can be difficult to differentiate between squeezing activity and through plane motion. So uh, I've highlighted a section to visualize this problem, where the bowel section you see here uh, seems to narrow and widen over time. But is that because there is squeezing activity in this section, or is it just being pushed in and out of frame by activity in neighboring sections or by breathing? Well, the answer here is a bit of both, which makes evaluation very challenging. And uh, as you can imagine, through plane motion is mainly a problem in manual evaluation, because algorithms can look at all dimensions at the same time. But this is where a second evaluation problem comes in. Namely, the small bowel has very complex geometry. And in the example, the red and blue sections may be separated by multiple meters of intestine, even though they seem to be right next to each other. And that means we can't use image-based proximity to compare motion features along the intestine. So to make evaluation of these images easier, we want to untangle the intestine. And schematically that looks like this. We stretch the bowel into a long tube. Uh, to get such a representation, we can draw a center line through the intestine and resample the image along this center line to form a multiplanar reconstruction, or MPR for short. Here on the left, you see an MPR that corresponds to uh, the manually annotated center line on the right that's highlighted in pink. So the reason that we work with sections is that not all of the intestines fit inside of our field of view. Uh, as each volume is imaged in less than one second, we only have 14 voxels of depth. And that means that not all of our intestines fit. So the intestine is cut up into visible sections that move in and out of the field of view. And this you can see in the axial and sagittal views. Um, these sections may later be stitched together into a reconstructed whole. But in this work, we purely focus on extracting center lines for the sections that are visible. So in terms of data set, we have MR images of 14 healthy volunteers. And as manual annotations are very labor intensive, we have these annotations for one time point, or frame. So in practice that means we have 14 volumes with annotated center lines, an average of about 13 sections per image. Um, we have some data specific challenges, namely extracting center lines in the small intestine is a very challenging task even for a human. And what you see here are three intestinal sections that pass over and under each other. But even with multiple views available, it can be very difficult to judge which parts are actually connected. And to make matters worse, we have a surprising amount of variety in image characteristics. Um, these three images were acquired on the same scanner, with the same protocol, but they look completely different. So that's due to differences in matters like abdominal fat content and the quality of bowel preparation. Well, so we want to extract center lines. Um, while to the best of our knowledge this has never been done in the small intestine, it is an established task in other domains, such as vasculature and airways. Uh, so, shown in the slide is a schematic overview of a method that was published by our group for extracting coronary artery center lines in CT. And this method consists of a network that operates on 3D patches around an artery and predicts the next directions. So, by starting at a seat point and iteratively stepping into the direction with the highest predicted probability, you can extract the center line. Um, when the logic confidence drops below a threshold, tracking stops. And, well, can we apply a similar method to the small intestine? Let's find out. So we adapted the previously shown centerline extraction concept to the small intestine by using uh, a different network architecture and slightly modifying the tracking algorithm such that it no longer requires radius annotations, as we don't have these available in our dataset. Our direction classifier is a 3D convolutional neural network with a VGG style architecture uh, that operates on cubic patches of 32 by 32 by 32 voxels that are sampled at 1.5 millimeters isotropic. And that gives us a receptor field that is slightly larger than our smallest dimension in the original images. It was trained by sampling patches that are centered on the small intestine centerline, as manually annotated, 
and subsequently backpropagating the tangent vectors. The crucial addition that we made was to add stochasticity to the system. We don't do this in a neural network, but when selecting the next direction based on a network output. Because what we get as network output is a probability distribution. We don't have to take the maximum, we can stochastically sample this result. The benefit of the stochasticity is that we now get a non-deterministic result. And by itself that doesn't improve our center line predictions, but it means we're no longer constrained to a single attempt at tracking. Uh, so what we can do is initialize multiple tracking agents where each agent yields a sample from the local solution space. And so we can explore this space and filter outliers. So let's see how that works. How do we deal with these outliers? Well, we initialize a number of tracking agents. In our experiments we used 64. And in each computation step we compute a probability distribution for all active tracking agents and then sample a next step for each of them. And once we have the new positions for all tracking agents, we can compute a consensus position. That's an average position of all active agents. We then check the distance of each agent to this consensus position. And if that distance exceeds a threshold, the agent is terminated. So the threshold we use is 25 millimeters, which is equal to the maximum nominal lumen diameter. Um, agents also terminate when the logic confidence drops below a threshold, the same as with the non-stochastic tracker. And when too many agents terminate, tracking stops. And that means we stop when either too many agents disagree, or when too many agents are very uncertain. To reiterate, agents don't synchronize their positions with the other agents between iterations. So they update their positions separately. And um, the only interaction each agent has with the other agents is the decision whether that agent should be terminated, based on its distance from the consensus position. And this is the visualization of this stochastic tracking algorithm in action, visualized from three directions. Here in white we have a projection of the ground truth, in yellow we have the manual start point, uh, in orange we have all of the tracking agents, and in red we have the trace of consensus positions, which is also the output of the algorithm. And we see some agents making mistakes, but as a majority of agents track this section correctly, these outliers are automatically ignored. So we can compute some quantitative accuracy measures. Uh, to define true and false positives we use a maximum distance threshold of 10 millimeters to determine whether our predicted lines are close enough to the ground truth to be considered correct, and vice versa. And here at 10 millimeters is a typical small intestine radius. Uh, so using this measure we can compute a recall and a precision metric, where the recall indicates how much of the ground truth was discovered by the automatic prediction, and in turn the precision indicates how much of the prediction is actually close to the ground truth. And to visualize this, um, here I give an example of the non-stochastic tracker, uh, this result has a high recall, because most of the ground truth was discovered, but it has a really low precision. Um, finally, we also compute an F1 score. You might know this as the dice score, which is simply the harmonic mean between the recall and precision. So we compare these metrics between the non-stochastic tracker in blue, and the proposed stochastic tracking algorithm in orange. And these results were obtained using leaf one out cross-validation, and in this graph the results of the sections are aggregated on an image level. Uh, so results from the same image are connected by a colored line, indicating which algorithm performed better in this case. Blue lines mean the non-stochastic tracker performed better, orange lines mean the stochastic tracker performed better, and gray lines indicate the results were equal on the second decimal. So what we see is a statistically significant improvement for all three metrics, but in particular we see a major improvement in precision. Here we see two examples where the non-stochastic tracker made mistakes. Uh, in white you see the ground truth, the yellow dot is the start point, and the blue lines are the non-stochastic tracker results. And on the left um, you see that the prediction follows the ground truth quite well for a while, but then it crosses the intestinal wall on both sides and it just keeps on tracking after it should have stopped. And on the right image the opposite happens, so um, the tracker makes mistakes quite close to the seat point, then runs into the wall and stops tracking entirely. And here we see the results from those same two sections, from the stochastic tracker, and in orange we see each of the stochastic tracking agents, and then in red we see the consensus positions. And as you can see here, a few of the tracking agents make similar mistakes as the non-stochastic tracker, as you would expect, but because they are a minority every time, these aberrant agents are ignored. So what do we see in these results? Well, first of all, the stochastic algorithm leads to much higher precision. And that means the agent-based stopping criterion is more reliable, 
than the previously used logit confluence thresholds. So the recall also improves, but not as often. But these improvements are mainly concentrated in moderately difficult sections, where the baseline method would sometimes fail, because the stochastic algorithm has more attempts to get it right, and as long as the majority gets it right, the section is tracked correctly. Uh, in very difficult sections, such as near air bubbles and image artifacts, this does not help, as the majority of agents will either disagree or terminate by themselves. The main limitation of this work is related to the annotations, because um, the annotated intestinal sections in the ground truth are sometimes incomplete. So some of these sections don't start or end at the edges of the field of view, but instead they end in a visually ambiguous region, where the annotator couldn't figure out the correct direction. Uh, and what this means is that our, both our training and our evaluation is slightly biased against these most difficult decisions, where a human couldn't figure it out either. Uh, another limitation is that we didn't thoroughly explore augmentation strategies. Only rotation augmentations were used. And uh, previous work has shown quite significant improvements when using more advanced augmentation strategies. Uh, so in future work we'll investigate how these augmentation strategies interact with the stochastic method and whether the two complement each other. So, in conclusion, uh, we see that adding stochasticity to the method improves tracking performance. We have gains in recall for the moderately difficult sections, and we have major gains in precision across the board. And that is all for me. Thank you very much for listening, and have a nice day.